to introduce our speaker, Jean Urban. And uh, Jean, if you'll notice in your program, and his wife Barbara moved to Huntsville, moved from Huntsville to Lincoln County with their eight children in 1984. Jean retired from NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in 1998 after a 40 year career as a research physicist and the science flight project manager. In 1996, his family opened Covenant Manor Assisted Living Home here in Federal, where he works as president, bookkeeper, maintenance man, dishwasher, everything but the cook, I think he said. Uh, but one of his long-term hobbies is genealogy. And uh, he's been a Rotary, of a Rotary member, a member of our club for, I, can anybody guess how long? See how observant anybody is. Since the year 2000. So, Gene, it's good to have you with us today. Thank you. <clears throat> How's, can you tell the level? Is that okay? Don's going to record this so I can give my family DVDs of this, this presentation. <clears throat> I'd like to um, report today on a, a successful search for one line in my family. And, and um, I, I don't want to bore you with a lot of family trees. I'd like to show you how, in this particular case, the family line got all intermixed with U.S. history. And as I was researching this, uh, I was really delighted at some of the things I learned about it. <clears throat> I started doing genealogy in 1977, uh, and through my, through my association with NASA, I traveled a lot. So for, for the next uh, 20 years, when I was on a business trip, if I had some spare time, uh, I would try to occupy myself with genealogy. And Barbara always said that, that um, she never worried about what I was doing on my off hours because she knew I was in some dusty library or, or looking at microfilm somewhere. I, I did all this uh, research in the days before the internet, or at least before the internet became so well populated with up-to-date uh, historical and genealogical information as it is today. And uh, when I retired in 98, um, I had, by that time, I had collected a great deal of information, but I just, um, it, it kind of languished. Uh, I had a lot of other things to do up here uh, in Fayetteville, so um, things got rather, rather quiet. In 2008, five years ago, in the spring, I suddenly realized that if something happened to me, my kids would never be able to figure out all the notes that I have, and I thought I should <coughs> begin to try to organize this stuff into, into a, some kind of a narrative. And as I did, I suddenly realized that one line of our family still had a big gap in it. And that's the gap I, I, I've focused on, and uh, I want to tell you about it right now. My mother's maiden name was Oler, O-H-L-E-R. And this is basically the line that we knew about back to where this dotted line begins. Um, I, in, in, from the information I had gathered, even back in 1977, I knew something about an Andrew and John and John and Adam, but I didn't, this whole period was, was a blank. Sim, not that I didn't have a lot of information, but I didn't have any way to connect the information I had to what I knew so far. So what I'm gonna talk about today is what I, what I uh, was able to uh, learn in the intervening time. Now, to do this right, I've got to give you some historical background in s several chunks. In 1632, uh, only 12 years after the pilgrims landed, uh, Charles I of England gave to um, the proprietors of, of Maryland, I can, uh, suddenly I'm blank, 
Well, it was Lord, Lord Baltimore's predecessor, but gave, gave uh, them the land that became Maryland. Fifty years later, in, in, in 1682, <coughs> Charles II gave William Penn the land that was, became Pennsylvania. And the problem was that knowledge of, from England about what, what our continent looked like was not very good. And there was a great overlap that ended up between Maryland and Pennsylvania. It was about a 20, a 20 mile overlap. Now this, this didn't turn out very well. I hope you can see it. But this is the current, current boundary of Maryland and, and uh, Pennsylvania. In those days, in the, in the early 1700s, Maryland thought that they owned up to this line, and Pennsylvania thought that they owned down to that line. And that made for, me, for enormous confusion right in this part of the, of the world. Uh, at the time, around, this, around 1710 was when um, Pennsylvania began to open up its lands to the west. This is, a, this is the um, Susquehanna River. <clears throat> and until about 1710, all of the population development in Pennsylvania had taken place to the east of the, of the Susquehanna. Maryland and Pennsylvania both had been advertising in Europe for people to come and settle. And people were beginning to come in slowly, Maryland more than in Pennsylvania, but by 1710 or so, uh, the state of, or the, co the, the colony of Pennsylvania opened up uh, the lands to the west of the Susquehanna. And within the next 20 years, a very large influx of, of European, of, mainly of Germans from the uh, central part of Germany began to move in land in Philadelphia and move out into this area. And, and that's when the, the, the problems began. Uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to um, talk today about three parts of, of Pennsylvania, focusing on this, uh, which is in that area that I just showed you. Um, our family, I uh, migrated from this area down into Maryland and then back up into Somerset County, Pennsylvania, and finally west to Iowa. And my mother's mother's side, this was my mother's father's side, my mother's mother's side started, for, came across into the upper uh, northwest of, uh, of Pennsylvania in Crawford County and later moved west. And so I'll be talking very briefly about these two. I'm going to come back and say something at the end. But this is where this, uh, this discussion now will concentrate. <laughs> Too many bluegrass. So I will be concentrating on, basically on these two counties, when the migration west began in 16, in 17, uh, 20 or 25, 30, Lancaster County was the only county in this region. And so most of the early migrations and the early land records were through Lancaster County, through the state of Pennsylvania and Lancaster County. And I, I want to, mention first that as these large numbers of, of German immigrants were coming into Philadelphia, into Philadelphia, into Pennsylvania, remember Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania was still a British crown colony and there was great concern about these, these, uh, these uh, German foreigners coming in. 
and in, 18, in 1727, the, the colony passed a rule that any immigrant had to, upon arrival in Philadelphia, uh, swear to an oath of allegiance to the King of England. And the, the colony then kept records of all of these ship arrivals and the oaths of allegiance that were sworn by the passengers who disembarked. And so those records and other records of, of land transactions are now available. Uh, they've been available for many years. Used to be pen and pencil, now it's the internet. Um, but all of these records uh, are, are a marvelous source of, of, uh, of data and from them came a lot of my progress in the last, uh, in those few years. So here's, so in 1749, the York County was formed and it was this entire area. And not until 1800 did Adams County, uh, be, was it Adams County set up. And everything that I'm gonna be talking about essentially took place right in this area of Adams, of what is now Adams County, but was then Lancaster and then right in the middle of it all, it all became part of York County. So that's where my records have been hiding away in various places. And I'll be concentrating on this right here. In the midst of this confusion over where the borders lay, a man named John Diggs in, in 17, 1720 was given a, a warrant to, to occupy 10,000 acres. And it, he, since he was coming through the state of Maryland, he thought he was getting his land in Maryland. And he came right up in here and this little red spot right here became the land that he, he uh, occupied and began to sell property from. He called it Digg's Choice. It's a, now a very well-known and notorious uh, uh, land situation from those days. And um, in the existence of the confusion, the existence of, the, of Digg's Choice and, and what it entailed uh, has produced some of the most interesting information I, I, I discovered. Um, I should say that the, the border dispute between Maryland and Pennsylvania was so intense at times that there were actually uh, sheriff's posses passing back and forth, kicking people off land, arresting people uh, who were supposedly in the wrong place. And, uh, and uh, our, my, my ancestor, uh, Peter Oler, uh, found himself in the middle of some of that. Anyway, John Diggs' uh, choice, Diggs' choice, ended up with about 7,000 acres that were finally surveyed uh, in this area. And as these immigrants began to move west, uh, the big influx started in about 1730. And the Germans would get off the ship, come west through Pennsylvania, they would uh, go to Pennsylvania authorities and, and, uh, and occupy property in, the, in this area. And sometimes they would f find that they were in or on Diggs' choice and Mr. Diggs uh, would come and demand that they pay him. Uh, they often ha would argue that, well, we've already bought our land from Pennsylvania. You don't you don't uh, own this. And again, not only were there militias moving back and forth in this area, but Diggs and, and his uh, cronies uh, were uh, heavily involved in, in legal arguments and sometimes physical arguments with, uh, with, the, with the settlers in this area. <coughs> Uh, 
Now, I showed on this, this chart that the, that the immigrant ancestor's name was Peter, Peter Oler, and that his son is Andrew Oler. And those, that was the big question mark I had when I began my research. So how did I find out who the connecting uh, link was what, and who, the, who the, uh, the immigrant ancestor was? Along with the Oaths of Allegiance uh, records, uh, there is a, a, a very large number of, of ships that came into Philadelphia in the 1700s. This is a list of all those ships that had somebody on board with, by the name of Oler, Ole, uh, a, a pronunciation that sounded like Oler. There are 16 of them, beginning in, 60, in 1730, and they're here in chronological order, all the way to 1773. And 10 years ago, I didn't know how to make a connection to that anybody on that list. Soon after I began my research in 2008, I ran across a, a, a record, a public record, from a church in the Conowago neighborhood, which is in that region that I showed you, that said that a baby named Andreas Oler was born to Peter Oler in the Conowago neighborhood, and his birth date was 22nd September 1734. If you look at this list, there's only one ship that arrived in America be before 1734, and that was the, the ship Thistle from Glasgow. Um, and Peter Oler was on board. There were 77 males on board who took the oath of office, oath, oath of allegiance, and a total of 260 people, which means there were about 180 men, uh, women, and children on the ship. This was. This was a marvelous piece of information because all of a sudden now I had, I had a clear uh, connection all the way back to Peter Oler. And at the time I assumed that Peter had come over with his family uh, and, that, and that Andreas, who became Andrew, um, was perhaps a second or third child um, and so until a week ago, I didn't have one more piece of information. A week ago, as I was putting this talk together, I ran across a, an analysis of the passengers on that ship, on the, on the thistle. Uh, you, may, you cannot read that from back there. I'm, I'm sorry, but essentially it says 1730 Thistle of Glasgow. It lists all the passengers, men, women, and children in, in family groups and with remarks. And right here is Peter Oler, Johann Peter Oler. And the beautiful piece of information here is that he was a witness to the child of Nick, Nickel Pfizer on the 5th of April, 1730, just before this, plant, this ship left Europe to come here. And uh, it names a town, Hausloch, which is in the central part of, of uh, Western Germany. So all of a sudden, not more than a week ago now, I know where Peter Oler uh, hailed from. So now I've got some more looking to do. As soon as I found out five years ago that Peter Oler was the ancestor who probably owned land in this area, so this is before I knew this, I just knew that Peter Oler was an immigrant who came here. I began to, I looked in the Pennsylvania archives for land purchases by a Peter Oler. And I found references to two sales of land in this region 
in the in the um, southern part of what is now Adams County to a Peter Oler. The Pennsylvania Archives contains not only records of of who bought, but exactly uh, what they bought, and there is a a record of every of the surveys and the legal documents on every one of these pieces of property. I was able to download off the internet uh, pictures of the two pieces of property that Peter Oler bought in this region. And let me use this map because it highlights the fact that it's, it's uh, right here. The red piece is Digg's Choice. And as I was reading about this, before I, before I even had the maps, there was a lot of reference to Digg's, Digg's Choice, confusion by, by people. And I even ran across a reference uh, about Peter Oler and Diggs. And that's the beauty of, of, of what I've done here, what, what I've found here is that not only was Peter Oler somebody on paper uh, back in 1730, 1750, but that I've got words that refer to him uh, in the Pennsylvania archives. And I found this extremely amusing. Um, in around 17, uh, December of 1745, 1746, um, a man named John Lemon, he's, uh, he's uh, immaterial here, passed through this region. And let me read you what, what is in the record in the Pennsylvania archives. He is, he is the deponent here. He's, he made a deposition to the state, to the colony. And further, this deponent declares that about seven or eight months past, that would be the dates I said, as I was passing through the, to, the send, to the Diggs Quarter on the same land to do some business, when I called at a certain Peter Oler's, who told, told me, that he understood that John Diggs was coming to survey some lands for a certain Jacob Banker, and that he, the said Oler, at the same time told this deponent that the said Diggs had no land there, but it all belonged to Pennsylvania, and that he, the said Oler, went then with him to, to someone else's house, a man named P, uh, Martin Kitzmiller. I'll come back to that name in a minute. near which place the said Diggs was expected to come that very day to survey land for the, this man named Banker, at which time he, the said Oler, declared to this deponent that he would, with a club or stick, knock the said Diggs down or drive him away. And he said Kitz Miller swore that he would shoot and kill the said Diggs if he offered to survey the land. That illustrates just how, how um, how the people clung to their land and fought off these uh, land barons. And then uh, <clears throat> this deponent asked the said Oler and Kitzmiller whether he should go tell Diggs, to which they both answered, yes, go tell him. And there's no record here that Diggs ever bothered to come around and get beat up or shot. But it, the, the, from this, before I had even a map of the property, I knew that, there were, that, that, that Peter Oler lived somewhere close to this Diggs Choice. So I got some maps. I even plotted the piece of land that Peter Oler has with some of the neighboring plots. And, uh, but I had no context into which in, to place these. They don't tell you. Uh, where you are relative to the, to the real geography there. So I still didn't know exactly where Peter Oler lived. Now I was doing this research in the, in the spring and summer of, of 2008, and in my, in my search, 
I ran across some information about a, a, a man named Neil, Neil Hively, a historian, who had put together a report on all the property in, in, in that area of, of, the, of the county, in, in that square. And he had done what I had done, except he knew what he was doing. And he also had generated a map. I, often, I ordered the map, and I got this marvelous piece of genealogical information. This is half of the map that he sent me. It goes all the way up, and it, and it covers that area in, in red, in the crosshatch there. This pink part right here is the part of Diggs Choice that extends over into what is now Adams County. Right here is Peter Oler's weird shaped piece of land, exactly adjoining Diggs. And the dates on these pieces of property show that, that Peter was one of the first settlers in this region. So when he got off the boat in 1730, he must have come directly west and uh, bought this piece of property and the other piece of property I mentioned is somewhere up here in York County and I haven't had time to uh, go find it yet. Um, here's Martin Kitzmiller's property. And so when Diggs came down to do the survey, he was encroaching, threatening to encroach on two of his immediate neighbors. And uh, these are the two who, who uh, threatened him. Now, it's interesting, <clears throat> this, this land, um, right adjoining it here, is a little triangular piece that belonged to, the, to a, a church. And although Peter Oler moved from here late, soon thereafter, the land remained with the church. And today, if I look on my, on my accurate uh, map of Pennsylvania, I can find the name of a church road that comes up right here. And I can see, the, the, see this little angle in the road. So I can, if I were able to drive through there, I could actually go and walk on this land. But it was, it was enough to know that, uh, that this is exactly where Peter Oler settled. Now, the road that is shown here in dotted line passes right through Kitz Miller's property and it passes right across the middle of Peter's property. It goes down across the state line into, um, into uh, Frederick County, Maryland. And of course, I, when I was discussing the boundary problems, I didn't, I didn't make the obvious, uh, the obvious conclusion that the way this boundary dispute was settled long after Peter moved away, long after this was done, was by Mason and Dixon who were sent over by the English to settle this dispute between the two English colonies. Mason and Dixon surveyed this line in 1763 to 667, uh, 20, 30 years after this. And, um, and of course, so the Mason-Dixon line was a geographical uh, solution to a boundary dispute and had nothing to do with, with social issues or anything else in those days. Um, Peter Oler, uh, oh, and, and I've also seen in this, in this book by Neil Hively, uh, a discussion of the survey of this highway that came down across here. And it mentions that, that um, it doesn't, doesn't say anything about pet crossing Peter Older's land, but it does say that uh, it, it stopped on Conowago Creek where Martin Kitzmiller had a mill. So Martin Kitzmiller had a grist mill in this property uh, and that is also recorded in the, in the state archives. And of course, Martin and, and Peter Oler were, were neighbors. <clears throat> Peter raised his family here for several years. And uh, about in, in, uh, in about 1750, 
he, for some reason, decided to move south. So he, he, he sold his property to uh, Conrad Eckert and moved about six miles south just across the state line. I don't have a map of it for today, but he's, he's, he w was living on this road about um, not more than two miles south of the, st of the border. And how do I know exactly where he lived? Well, in 1755, he appeared in the court of Frederick County, Maryland, and offered two, two petitions to the court. This was uh, in the November court of 1755. Peter Oler offers the following petition to the court. Your petitioner lives on the main road between Fredericktown, which is down here, and Yorktown, which is up here. Your petitioner, and that's of course this highway right here, used to go through his property. Your petitioner has seen a great deal of inconvenience in the road and bring the road some considerable distance nearer than it now is and a far better road by your petitioner's house where he now lives. And he is willing to make the road good and sufficient for wagons and others on his own cost and charges, provided you, the court, will be pleased to allow the same to be the county road. So essentially he said, I'll fix the road up if you'll make it the main, the main highway here. And later on in that same court session, uh, there's another petition. Peter Oler petitions the court for a license to keep tavern, stating, Quote, your petitioner lives on the road from Fredericktown to York in Pennsylvania near the Pines on Piney Creek. Well, Piney Creek comes up and ends right about here. And I can see from the map that there's a forested area right in here. So I'm, I, I know that Peter Oler moved right down here and lived there for several years. And ultimately, the family moved farther south uh, a few miles down here into Taney Town, and the, in the census records later on, they show up uh, in, uh, in Northern Maryland right here. Then the family moved, almost the entire amount of the family moved to Somerset County, back up in Pennsylvania, about 1795. And subsequently, they moved on west. But they lived in Somerset County for about 80 years. So the, the progression of this immigrant family uh, is now I've got the documentation that carries it all the way to uh, the present day. It's interesting that these people seem to have ants in their pants. How, they didn't stay very long in one place. Uh, Peter Roller lived in this region for, well, he, first he left Germany. Then he, he uh, lived here for five years, maybe eight years, moved down into Maryland, lived there for a few years. And, and then his family, I think he died in, in, in Frederick County, Maryland. But then his family moved on west to Somerset County. And then they lived there for a a couple of generations and then migrated on to the west to Waterloo, Iowa. Lived there for about 70 years and then the family migrated into Lincoln, Nebraska where my mother was born. I'd like to come back to this, this map before I before I conclude, the historical involvement has been interesting and it's been personal because there's been direct interaction between my ancestors and things that were happening on the ground. Something happened in each of these three areas about 60 to 80 years later and more recently, which are not part of my genealogy, but they provide a, a very interesting uh, 
historical connection to the region. First, Adams County. Uh, anybody know what the county seat of Adams County is? Gettysburg. And so this region, in t on this map, Gettysburg sits right here. And so during the Gettysburg campaign in the Civil War, this whole region was overrun with troop movements and battles. The, the Seminary Ridge uh, is, comes right down through here. So if the family still were in that region, they would have been uh, deeply involved in the Gettysburg campaign. Anybody know what Titusville, Pennsylvania? Oil. Oil was discovered in Titusville, West Pennsylvania, a very small amount of, uh, just before the Civil War. And of course, in those days, there wasn't a great deal of use for oil. And once it was, once there was some commercial uh, uh, success with the oil field there, but ultimately it sort of petered out. And I've been there and you can tell that there's an, been an, an oil industry there, but it's extremely weak and, and, and uh, um, essentially defunct today. And Somerset County, anyone know what happened in Somerset County in 2001, December 11th? That's where Flight 93 crashed. So <clears throat> inadvertently through the, through the passage of time, uh, my family line has, has touched past some important American history. Are there any questions? Jim. Not so much a question as a comment. You know, all these records go back to survey after survey after survey, and we don't really know what the qualifications of the surveyors were or how they got started. You know, yes. All of these landmarks with the big oak tree and you go out to the rock stick it out of the ground east of the so and so. It's amazing that didn't have any more land terminal than I had. Oh, yes. Because of the, you know, the inaccuracies in many cases of the surveying project. And that was just a, a matter of mistakes being made, but then when you had deliberate, deliberate uh, um, con men going around and, and trying to sell or demand, uh, demand payments for land they didn't even own, as John Diggs did. I mean, he ended up with a bad reputation all across the board. Uh, this piece of land right here, originally Peter Oler got a warrant for 100 acres. But when they finally surveyed it several years later, it was 208 acres. So, uh, so who knows who was right in these, bo in these borders? We don't know whether, whether uh, the land that Pennsylvania gave him really was uh, encroaching on John Diggs or whether John Diggs was trying to take his uh, um, take advantage of of this poor German settler but uh, at one point the record says that a group of like 24 German German immigrants came to the Pennsylvania court and made essentially a statement that look we came here uh, under good faith, we bought this land that we own uh, out here in the wilderness, and we thought we were doing the right thing. Please stop harassing us. <laughs> Gene, were there any immigration laws at that time? Um, yeah, one, come. <laughs> the P Pennsylvania was begging for settlers to come and, and fill up the land and begin to develop it, and so was Maryland. Um, um, Pennsylvania, although, it, I mean Maryland, although it had been in place uh, 50 years longer than Pennsylvania, was still beginning to develop the western part of the state only, uh, only in the late 1700s. Gene. Uh, Mike, remember, remember, uh, I built plant, uh, lots of land for the Pennsylvania Pennsylvania. 
formation of the United States, there were possibly as many German speakers as there were English speakers. And it's kind of interesting that we ended up with uh, English as the cause of the colonial yeah. uh, governments as being the official language. If you look at the names on these, on these, uh, all these surveys, or I read them in the index in this book, 95% uh, of them are German. And uh, they all came from a region in south, in central, west central Germany called the Palatinate. It was a, a political subdivision. Uh, there was some, somebody who was a lord over this area. They were treated very badly. The people were, was, were uh, really beat upon and battles uh, uh, came through that region repeatedly. And so when Pennsylvania offered land, a lot of these people left in relief. I mean, they they finally we can go somewhere. What they would do, they, this the Rhine River runs through the Palatinate. They would travel to the Rhine. They would get on a river boat. They'd go down the river to uh, to Rotterdam, in Holland. They'd get on an English ship, which would then take them over to England. And I guess in some cases lists of the passengers were made there in England, and then they would sh sail to, Pencil uh, to uh, Philadelphia and unload and give their oath of allegiance. So there are some places I've got uh, double, double lists of, this, of the people on these ships. So, uh, and it's the, the, names, the name variations are amazing too. Uh, Oler was spelled in probably six or eight different legal ways. And so when you're doing research on something like this, you don't look for the spelling, you look for how the word sounds, how it would sound if, if someone pronounced it, because it Yes? My, my Fisher line stops about 1790 in Allegheny County, Pennsylvania. Um, if I looked at the ship's manifest, I, I would probably find a bunch of Fishers, I'm guessing. Yes. Probably can't get a connection that way. Any advice on how Mike can follow him back? Well, if you can trace the family that you know of back, you may make a connection the way I did, where where it can only be one or two or three of those immigrants. And that'll help. But if you go to the Pennsylvania archives, you ought to be able to find indices that give those names, and you can go back down through there and find out all that information. Cool. Oh, that's online. It's it seems to all be online. I was amazed at how much, how much stuff that I had dug out with paper and pencil and microfilms and in dusty libraries was now available with a push of a button. Cool. Just for general interest, uh, you would know, very well. The local library is making a real effort. The Huntsville Heritage Room in the Huntsville Library is an enormous genealogical, genealogical resource. They've got a lot of reference material. And they've got microfilms of all the <laughs> census records, but I think most of the census records now are available on the internet. So you don't even have to go read a microfilm. And I will just add that Friends of the Library, we've just met uh, this month and we've, um, we've allocated $7,000 for the genealogy Great. Gene, if you would, I, I didn't ask you to introduce Miss Barbara and your daughters that are. Oh, I'm sorry. If you would, I appreciate it. Yes, um, my wife Barbara and my daughter Nancy in the purple and Susan in the black are here today, too. It's good to have y'all with us. Thank you. Thank you, Gene. Thank you. Oh. Why, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, we appreciate that. That's very interesting. Um, our drawing, if somebody would...